When I go to Sacramento, I will pump up Sacramento. 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 Some say the news is fake. Others say it's real. These two don't have the time to check. Instead, Turner Sparks and Michael Ira Kaplan turn to comics stationed around the globe to be their eyewitness reporters so that you can know what's really going on. This is Lost in America. All right, everybody, welcome to Lost in America, episode 208. My name's Turner Sparks. And I'm Michael Kaplan. You can find me at turnersparks.com. You can find Kaplan at cap in america on instagram i'm also on instagram uh, uh turner sparks uh at turner sparks on instagram this show lost in america pod.com cap uh yes. let's see got? let's talk well on the show today we have william childress he is he's a guy who started comedy with years ago and um he all he lived after he left china where he where we started out he went to myanmar and he founded the comedy community the comedy scene he's in- the a king of myanmar comedy he's the king of comedy in myanmar yes king of the, comedy that's he's, <laughs> he's the robert de niro of myanmar <laughs> comedy scene before we get to so we're going to talk to him about uh about on sun su chi about the leader of myanmar about everything that's going on they, they just had an election she just got reelected. but before we get to him kaplan yes. let's talk about us of course let's, us. let's always leave with us don't leave with the guest leave with us if you guys like this show if you want to support this show and if you want to get more of me and kaplan doing on this show we always say lost in america we learn about the world right on our other show live from the bunker the world learns about us me sir michael ira kaplan in quarantine in our bunkers in new york city our daily lives this is a full throttle comedy podcast 30 minute show three times a week just you just me every once in a while we have a guest Every once in a while, we might do a bonus one of these Lost in Americas like we did this past week, right? We had Peja Bajevic, our good friend from Serbia, talk to us about how all the priests in Serbia are getting COVID because they won't stop kissing each other at funerals. (laughs) Exactly. But most of the time, it's me and you doing comedy. The way you can get that show and support us, be the engine that drives this show, is go to to patreon.com slash Lost in America. There is a link to that in the description of this show. And for $5 a month, you can get Kaplan and I doing that show three to three days a week. So this show for free once a week, plus three more times another show uh, for $10 a month. Kaplan, what can they get? For $10 a month, we will send you a t-shirt, a number one in Armenia, uh, ex- to commemorative t-shirts, commemorating our rise to the top of the, the very exclusive podcast charts in the great country of Armenia. We were number one there. We've since gone to number one in Peru and ding, ding, ding. We went to number one in Chile last week. We should thank our fans for that. But we, uh, we, the number one in Armenia, you always remember your first. So we have a t-shirt for that. We will send it to you for $10 a month. It's a great deal because you could also buy that shirt for $25. But for $10 a month, you get it for free. So Exactly. It's 25 bucks if you just want to buy it on our site or for $10. And you could do what other people do. They put in they put 10 bucks a month. They do that one month. And then the minute uh, we give them the shirt, they bail and go back down to we five bucks. A bunch a month. of scammers in our audience. We know who you are. We know who you are. We will not name names. S- no. I mean, you should jo- <laughs> exactly. are, are and join the, the Patreon immediately because this week's going to be hot. We're going to be, we're going to have to recap all of our Thanksgivings and we're going to have to, I'm going to take a victory lap about the New York City school system coming back in business. So it's going to be a good week of shows. Mr. Bill de Blasio finally no. came down on your side, Kaplan. Yes, exactly. Congratulations. I'm, I'm Let's get to the show. Oh, also, last thing we should say. We said thank you to all of our listeners last month. Last month, October 2020, was our biggest month in terms of downloads in our podcast four-year history. Guess what? This month, November 2020, beat last month. Records are made to be broken, they say. And we are growing. We are, we're like a, a tech company that's on the rise. We've, we're IPO'd and we're booming, baby. We're like the some- early days of MySpace. <laughs> the early days of, uh, you're Tom. <laughs> you got to- I'm Tom. <laughs> so thank you, everybody. Yeah. Thank you for enjoying this podcast. Thank you for telling your friends. Please continue to do that. Continue to rate yeah. and review us on iTunes and all that stuff. And just tell your friends, because the more people we get in, the more, the more we keep these, uh, these uh, cool guests coming back and we keep the shows going. So Kaplan, should we, get, should we move on to today's show? We should move on to our, our guest from Myanmar. 
Kaplan, before we get to him, what do you know about Myanmar? And then he can, I'm going to, you tell him what you know. I'll tell him what I know. He can tell us what we got wrong and what we got right. I, I, this is, you know, we talk, you know, you, you're Mr. Asia on this podcast. I know a lot about a lot of places in the world, but Asia, I'm not so good. You know, I know, I know, uh, I know that Burma was a place, right? You All know, right. Let me start. Let me start. You don't seem on. to know anything. I'm going to I'm going to take over here. Yes. Burma and Myanmar are the same place. If that's all, you know, I got yeah. trouble for you. You're going to have to keep up with this episode. So here's what we know is that in the uh, uh, 1980s, they had well, they had a military junta junta. I'm not sure what the term is. The military yeah. ran the country for many, many years. In 1988, in 1988, Unsung Suu Kyi who was the um, daughter of a former leader of the country, but she moved to Britain to go to college and all that stuff. In 1988, she came back to visit her mother. She led a couple protests. Bang, she got arrested, okay? Because they thought she might be, the junta thought she might be a competitor to take over the country. Right, because her dad was very popular at one point, so. Exactly, so she gets put in in prison. It might be be house arrest. Uh, William can clear that up for us in a second. But anyway, she gets put in prison in 88. She then spends the next, uh, until 2010, in and out of prison. They let her out for a couple of years. She starts a couple more protests. They go, we thought you were learned your lesson. Looks like you didn't. Back into prison, okay? So she's in and out, in and out. But it, it, during this time she's in prison, she, she beca- in, in Mur- Burma, uh, her whole family is still in England. She's still in, they're still in the United Kingdom. She now becomes a hero of the world. She, becomes, she wins a Nobel Peace Prize in 1991. She's for, like a Nelson Mandela of sorts, a female. Exactly. She becomes a Nelson Mandela type. Her husband dies in 1999 in England. She doesn't even leave to go see him. She says, I love my country more than I love you mm. or something like that. Problems in that marriage, I think. But yeah, go on. Yeah, that, that struck me as a little bit odd. But moving on. <laughs> 2010, she finally gets let out of prison uh, for some reason that they decide to have an election. So a couple of years later, she wins the election. She becomes now the leader of the country. And then what happens right now? Everyone's so excited. It's like when Nelson Mandela becomes president, the like same thing. And then her very first move is to commit genocide. Yeah, on, she turned heel. I love it. <laughs> I yeah, on genocide. some minority, minority group. And she turned, into, she turned heel, classic heel turn. I don't know why. That's where we're left with today. Yeah. William's going to answer our we questions. Know she tur- yeah. William, how did we do so far? And welcome you, to you the got show. Pretty, hey, I'm happy to be here. Hey, Turner. And, let's, and actually, doing, I should man? give you a proper introduction. William Childress, yes. not only, as I said, not only uh, we started together at Kung Fu Comedy in Shanghai, he went on That's to right. create the comedy scene in Burma. He went to the Edinburgh Fringe Festival in Scotland, did an entire show about uh, his life in Burma, which is very popular. Oh, the funniest man in Burma. The funniest man in Burma you're listening to, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> and then he's now in Atlanta where he does stand-up comedy when he's allowed to do stand-up comedy all the time. Oh, Welcome we're doing to the show, it, William. It's great to have you back. Thanks. It's great to be back. It's great to to be with you guys again. This is the second or third time. I mean, I third did it once. Third time, I believe. Third time. Yeah, that's right. Because it was the studio once, and then it was uh, I talked about when Georgia started, uh, you know, opening up for COVID, and now I'm here to 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 be an expert on all things uh, Myanmar. Are well, you the only person say. in the world who's an expert on Myanmar and Georgia and a comedian? <laughs> And no, I live like two blocks from the from the Carter Center, and they do all the uh, like the they check on uh, the transparency of elections and things like that in other countries and now here. But no, I mean, there's probably somebody like two blocks away from me that knows a lot more. Well, do they do country. comedy? And also, <laughs> yeah, but you're not also, you're funnier. But also, I got I got to give a plug to New American Pathways. You know, uh, Clarkston, Georgia, right outside of Atlanta, is the has the highest per capita number of refugees in the country. And uh, many of those are resettled from Myanmar um, along the borderlands where civil war still rages, even though one of Aung San Suu Kyi's promises was to end that civil war. Uh, so there's a lot of, there's actually a, uh, way more Burmese than you would think in the Atlanta area. Well, let's get into it. So as you just touched on, she was going to end the civil war, the civil war. Some people it's a civil war, but also in 2017, she it's a lot. There's a lot of reports that genocide may have happened. Well, well, so let's let's start with the the fact that um, for years, the Rohingya people um, who live in uh, Rakhine State, which is 
Um, it's a state uh, along the, I guess, Bay of Bengal um, on the uh, on the western coast of Myanmar. Um, those people who are Muslim um, have been kind of disenfranchised for for years, um, even before the current genocide. There were, you know, they were kind of denied a lot of rights. They were often harassed by the military. Um, there was a tremendous amount of disinformation put out about them on Facebook that was very, very uh, fascinating to look at now in light of the disinformation campaigns that run rampant on Facebook currently. I think that um, Zuckerberg should be put in The Hague. Um, uh, or sent to the Hague. I guess they have a prison there too. Um, Do they have a prison? They, they have a hole at the Hague. They have a put them in the hole at the Hague. It's got to be pretty cushy, though. I mean, there's got to be some heavy hitters there. Um, yeah. But, <laughs> put them in the hole at the Hague. <laughs> yeah, but so, so the, mili- the, the, the Burmese military um, kind of ramped up everything with the Rohingya. And it's really, I've, I feel like that meets all the qualifications, which there are some, of a, of a genocide in terms of. Um, they're being made to be stateless. See, the thing is, Burmese people always said, "Well, they're not Burmese. They're they're from uh, they're from Bangladesh. They're Bengali." They would call them. And then Bangladesh would say, "Well, no. Like they haven't lived here for, you know, centuries or whatever. They're they're Burmese, and so neither one to claim them. It's just another. Most of the civil wars on the borders and the issue with the the Rohingya, like a lot of that has to do with, uh, you know, like." colonialism like the colonization of uh india and and burma um and the fact that like some arbitrary borderlines were drawn and things like that and the burmese never considered themselves one cohesive people to begin with um and just to clear some, up the rohingyas live on the they live in me and they lived in me and they live but near on the border. Border. yeah near right. bangladesh so, yeah so they get shuffled back and forth they there have been multiple times where they'll get sent to the border and then the Burmese military will, you know, attack them as they're fleeing to the border. When they try to come back over the border, once once uh, Bangladesh kicks them out, you know, they'll do the same thing. They'll attack them. Um, Meanwhile, so, killing hundreds, thousands of them, right? Yeah, and many of them flee to uh, to these boats that take them out in the ocean. They say, we're going to take you to Malaysia because Malaysia and Indonesia, predominantly Muslim countries, take in a lot of these Rohingya people, and they actually have programs to... to kind of settle some of them as refugees. Um, but a lot of the boats would uh, basically turn them into slave labor. And they would say, well, you can't swim, can you? Guess what? You're a fisherman now. Oh my and um, or they would sometimes like take them out, ransom them, you know, um, or just throw them over the boat, you know, just kill them. Um, so one of the things that An Sun Su Chi, there's a number of things she promised. But some of the main things just to keep it kind of simple. Uh, some of the main things were to end civil war, plural civil wars going on in the country. Cause there's a number of armed ethnic groups, almost all at the borderlands of the country. So there's, there's fighting that goes on, especially around the Thai border, um, golden triangle area. But then really a lot of the border areas, um, she was going to end that. Okay. And she was going to um, end uh, the military's um, guaranteed seats in the Burmese parliament. Um, and they're guaranteed 25% of the parliament, right? Right. Correct. They're guaranteed yeah. 25% of, of parliament, which is enough so that it, I, for the specific number is enough that like whatever you're going to get through, you have to have some military support for. Um Right, because you need three quarters of, I think, votes to get. It's, yeah, it's something yeah. like that. Like, <laughs> so it's something like you need, need just yeah. over three, like one yeah. more than three quarters. So you and need guess one who, military person, yeah. Yeah, and guess who's going to vote in a solid block every single time? So, um, yeah. Fin- uh, so you know, so she we- was going to spread democracy and, and, and um, in military rule, in um, the civil war. She never said anything about ending the genocide because that's that's not – what she campaigned on that's she yeah. avoided she's for years has avoided even saying the word rohingya because that's like that is like a flashpoint in the country is what to call these people you know that's so, why they'll call them bengalis and they won't call them rohingya ah because so they're, they're trying to make, make the it, point that they're not even they never were a right. part of our country okay so did yeah. she just to clear up here she she came into power was it 2012 or 2015 i know she got let out of prison in 2000 well, she got 
So she got let out of prison in 2010, like you said. She, well, it was not prison. She was in her house arrest. She house was never arrest. in prison. Yeah. She was always in her house arrest in um, a house that's like a um, hundred yards away from the American Embassy. Um, there on um, one of the large lakes that kind of center in Yangon. Yeah. It's been a while. I forget which one it is. Um, but she's under house arrest. Uh, she got out. And she would give speeches from from inside the house. Yeah, you know, she would she would stand up over the gate and talk to some of her supporters when she was able to do that. A lot of this has been kind of partially fictionalized. There's a pretty good movie starring Michelle Yeoh called The Lady. It's about it. that. Yeah, that's that's what how I, I I told my parents to watch that when I moved there because they didn't know anything about it and they're like, oh, it seems like you live in a really scary place. I was like, it's not, <laughs> it's not that bad. Like, and my, and and my grandma knew less. Um, New lesson Michael did about about um, uh, about she was less educated than Kathleen about the country. All I she mean, knew, who knows about this country? This is not. I know about Sharansky and those prisoners. I don't know about. In, <laughs> all in all she knew America. was like, well, she was like, my grandson lives in a country that begins with an M and used to begin with a B, and it's <laughs> yeah. that's literally all she knew. About it. So she gets out um, of prison in two, or she gets out of house arrest two thousand ten. And why did? the military even let an election happen because they had been, the military had been ruling the country for 30 years. Right. Well, I think, I think that they did it to, and I, I, there is probably like a real answer that I don't know for sure. Yeah, sure. But I, I seem to remember it was kind of for appearances and they're like, yeah, we can get yeah, whatever. Like we're going to rig this thing anyway. Okay. Or we're just going to, or we're just going to let it happen. Uh, and I think part of it was a lot of the shit they do is for aid money. It's like, okay, like if, if we hold elections, then some of these countries will stop boycotting our stuff. We'll stop, you know, freezing our accounts, all this kind of stuff. Like, look, we're, we're making, we're transitioning to democracy. But as soon as she was elected in a landslide, they're like, oh yeah, no, that, that didn't count. That, um, but that, all of a sudden, she now has power. Is it 2012? Those or? voting machines were made by Dominion, actually. I don't know if <laughs> oh, my God. Here we go. <laughs> sure. We'll get to Georgia on, at the buddy. end of this episode. Let's uh... So, wait. Was that 2000? That was like 2012 when she it was got... like 2010, 11. They had an election like right before that, right? They had one okay. in 2010, and they had another one in 2012. Or And the idea, I, I do remember when I was there, because I've done your show there a couple of times. I remember talking to somebody, I think it was a a Burmese guy, maybe saying that um, he was like, well, the military, when the military leaves power, all the same people were still in power. They just took off their military. They took off their their uniforms. Yeah. And they put on business suits. Ah, yeah. But ultimately it's the same thing. So they still had a gun in there. So then is she, um, once she gets power, does she really have power or is she a figurehead, but she's made some deal with the government, well, the well, military, let me be a president or whatever they call me, but you guys can still made, run the show. Well, so after she got elected, they, and they did not honor that, they made constitutional changes that one of the things barred someone from being president. If I believe it's, if they have, Children. If they're married to a foreigner or if their children are, are partially foreign, something right. like that. Then you can like, so she has a, she has a British husband who died of cancer while she was under house arrest. And she has, um, you know, two um, uh, British Burmese children, one of whom I think lives in Oregon. Um, and so like, they basically were, ju- they might as well just added the constitution. Uh, Aung San Suu Kyi cannot be president. Yes. Um, that's how petty and specific it was. So, so she appointed a minister to take that essentially once she was actually elected 2015, she appointed a minister to kind of have a figurehead role. And then she ran everything and everybody knew that. And that was like, there's nothing they could do about it. Whatever. Like the the military kind of knew. Yeah, whatever. That's the way it's going to be. But she's not, you know, some title, but it's like some random title. Right. It's like a state counselor, a minister or something. That's I think it's it count- uh, something yeah. like that. Okay. Yeah, it's it is something like that. But she does call the shots um, since 2015, basically. Right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so I've heard a couple people explain why, because the, the, the thing is, she brought she's a Nobel Prize winner. She brought all this, um, you know, people were really hopeful for the future of the country. They really thought she could bring about change. Like Mandela. Not just because her grand her her father 
Um, um, actually, her father was the first leader of an independent Burma in 1948 uh, before he was assassinated in the Secretariat building downtown. Um, uh, Aung San. And um, that just because of her unique story, her connection to the outside world and the people that loved her within the country, she was a person to bring them back to the world stage, to bring them out of, you know, this, this decades long military junta where they were basically like North Korea with palm trees kind of. And the, the problem with that, I feel like, is that I've seen it described that, that she was maybe never the person who was ever going to stand up for the Rohingya. Uh, it, people, it, pre- that, that was a they prejudice project, they that projected she had, on like the, everybody else. They projected, you think, what they wanted to believe? Because exactly. she ever asked exactly about right. how she felt about the Rohingya? And she just, or she... Uh, you know what? She was, she was, no, she never gave a good answer about it ever. Yeah. Like the thing yeah. is, she's been a real coward about all of this and has always dodged it to the point where people really started to believe like, well, how could she be like this? That's like, well, she never, she wanted, she wanted free elections, right? Uh, right. She wanted the military to be gone, but she might've had her own idea about the ethnic, the racial order of the country. She wasn't necessarily this, against ethnic cleansing. Right. Not necessarily. She was because, democracy, <laughs> but also, you know. No, because part of the reason, so Burmese, part of the country, the majority ethnic group in Myanmar are the, are the Burmans, hence the name Burma. But right. there are, you know, dozens of other ethnic minorities, many of whom have their own armies, have their own kind of, wow. essentially their own little, uh, little territories right or like armies. wow yeah for sure i mean there's the the korean uh army and there's the wa state army there's the kachin army and there's like there's they're everywhere and so they never consider themselves part of this big country called burma because they're like look the british did that we had our, we were just people in, the, in this part of the jungle ah. or we had this connection we never agreed to be in a country with these people you know, we live in the same, you know, spit of land about the size of Texas or whatever, but we're not, we're not the same. And, you know, some of that, there were basically the, the recent elections where she was elected in a landslide. Many of the places where the ethnic minorities held sway were not even allowed to vote. Well, that's um, what we wanted to get to. Yeah. So she, um, she but let's she get, let's get, there, let- let's get there in a minute. I have more. Yeah. Questions. Right. We, yeah, we, actually, we, here's something I didn't even know is um, I had thought that this uh, ethnic cleansing of the Ro, Ro, Rohingya, Ro, Rohingya had only happened in 2017. I thought this was right. an was isolated happening. incident. So it's been going on for years. I did not even know that. Yeah, it was. Um, yeah, I mean that was that was going on while you when you, when you were there visiting. That was you were supporting that there. Oh my yeah. gosh! <laughs> yeah, Trevor, you could have stopped it. I was in some way something. endorsing you, it yeah. by doing. It was like the people Jokes who would go to not like, equal. Oh my gosh! Yeah, yeah. Wait, um, but but wait, but so and Amnesty International, we should say, gave her like an award in two thousand and nine, and she won a yeah. Nobel Peace Prize. But nobody yep. ever asked her this whole time, like, what you think of. These people who are being genocided or what you would do about it or she just you know, I don't I, <laughs> I know that she had been asked that over time I don't know when the earliest questions were because the, you have to wonder like when were people really aware of this to ask mm-hmm. her the question about it yeah right um but I do know that when she was in power that she would not say Rohingya that she would give pretty non-committal answers you know in in the 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 question is there's no good ex- period there's no good excuse for it period and it does need to be stressed that that this is one of at least two genocides occurring in the world right now that nobody's really doing anything about, you know, yeah. um, the others, the, the Uyghur people, obviously. So the Uyghurs are Rohingya. I was going to say, both. which is the other one? Because we got to book a comedian for that one. And then I'm like, Oh wait, never mind. Well, well, <laughs> yeah, it turned into that big Xinjiang tour. Um, but yeah, so I didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> but it's it's it remains to be seen whether she genuinely doesn't care or might hold these same prejudices as a lot of the country does or if the military still has way more power than even yes. the 25 percent of the parliament would lead you to believe and they still pull all the strings and that they basically say to her hey look you can deal with with like policy stuff 
for the people and whatnot. But in terms of like what we consider security and our border security, et cetera, we're going to do that and you're not going to do a damn thing about it. And so to save face, she just doesn't, she's not going to tell the people that she's against it. So this could be a deal she made to get most of what she wanted done or maybe Possibly. all of what she wanted done. Maybe she Possibly. genuinely doesn't like them and doesn't care about them. Um, yeah, and yeah but we like, nobody really knows. We just assumed she would care about them because we assumed she was this one person that she never said she was. It's like Bob Dylan in the yeah. 60s. You yeah, know? <laughs> she in fairness to her, she didn't lead us on. She didn't false. Yeah. She, she kept her campaign promises, you know, <laughs> she, she lowered taxes. <laughs> she, so what about this? Why is she not? If the world seems to agree that genocide has been committed while she was yeah. the leader of the country, why is she not being held up by an international tribunal of some sort? She was called to The Hague and she defended her country and her military to The Hague. Wow. Uh, she went. She actually went there? A year or two ago? They didn't throw her in the hole while she was there? <laughs> uh, no. No, you know, I mean, you know how they are at The Hague. I mean, Bush is still free, right? <laughs> if I got called there, I don't think I would show up. Well, <laughs> she hired Rudy Giuliani as her lawyer. And she... <laughs> So she, so that's she, interesting. Been, so she did go there. Uh, she went to The Hague. I'm, I'm pulling this up now. Uh, pulling this up. Yeah, she went to The Hague um, in December of last year, actually, and defended um, the genocide. She called allegations of genocide incomplete and misleading. Um, but look, more than 700,000 were forced to flee the country. Nobody really knows um, exactly how many have been killed. They have raised uh, entire villages, you know, and they denied it. But uh, a number of organizations, maybe Bellingcat, which is great. I don't know if you know them. You should talk to, there's a guy you should talk to from there. They do um, open source investigations. So like what they did, Bellingcat, B-E-L-L-I-N-G-C-A-T. They're the people that, that figured out that the Russians took out MH17, right? Uh, the Malaysian airline. Oh, okay. Malaysian airline. They, yeah. they actually, they even went on Twitter. They'll do things like they'll go on Twitter and they'll see people tweeting about, Oh, Hey, like a, a rocket launcher just drove down our village and they'll timestamp that. And then they'll create a map of when the Russians were bringing in the rocket launcher into Ukraine. Um, and they, for they'll like backtrack it from tweets wow. and from leaked audio. And so things that any of us can find, they actually d use satellite imagery and went and found, all these uh, Rohingya villages that had been burned to the ground and like wow. even like covered up, even like the ashes covered up. So, wow. uh, I mean, there's, yeah, there's yeah. reports of mass graves. Yeah. That yeah I they've, think been, they've, been, they've been found and there were the two uh, journalists, uh, Jaw Soy U and I gotta forget the other guy's name, but um, there are two Burmese journalists that uncovered and linked a, a mass burial site to the Burmese military. They created the link to prove it and they were put in jail yeah for, well, they were that, put in jail for for a long time for a that gets years. me to my next question which is um not only so if we say that well she's doing everything good it's just this one thing she had to make a concession to the military it still doesn't bear out with uh uh the idea that she's um i guess repressing like a lot of people there are saying now the press the press is less free than it was There's far more censorship than there ever. I mean, yeah, I mean, they, under they the dictatorship was, even. Yes. Uh, wow. Look, oh, no. Am I wrong there? What? It's not as much as during the dictatorship because during the dictatorship, you couldn't put out anything. And there was actually okay. uh, organization called like the board of scrutiny and censorship or something like that, where like, you know, that there was um, like people would write poetry and hide government criticism in the poetry you know, yeah, and like nobody reads poetry. poetry. That's smart. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah, for sure. Nobody with like, you know, uh, military uniforms. And they yeah. Poetry. <laughs> um, but, but it's not as bad as that. But uh, Wallone and Jaw Soy U were the two Reuters journalists, I believe Reuters. Um, yeah, Reuters who were imprisoned um, for reporting on that uh, on the, the mass grave. And like so, that, nothing like, I mean, like that. Nobody thought something like that would be happening under Aung San Suu Kyi. Yes. That two, that two reporters who were doing amazing work, um, they were actually, I forgot what happened, but like the police basically like entrapped them 
like a, a guy said like, Oh, I have like a cell phone or something you need to see and like gave it to him or put it in their bag or something. And then the police were like, Oh, look, you have, you know, uh, stolen like secret information. So, um, so what happened to her? Like, why did this, there was clues, I guess she turned heel. There must've been no, I don't know. Is I mean, that the big question that everyone yeah. wants to know? Yeah. What That's happened? what everybody wants to know. But like the fact yeah. is that, is that Burmese people, obviously they're not a monolith. I mean, for sure. Uh, ethnically, they're definitely not, but in terms of opinion, even of the majority uh, Burman population, they love her. And yes, uh, you know, it, it's difficult to stress quite enough what a savior figure she was for years. And, and the fact that she, that she, was under house arrest and that, that she persevered for so long as a symbol of democracy uh, uh, and a symbol of wh as whatever people wanted to project onto her. Like we said, um, it's really tough to break away from that despite evidence to the contrary. And another thing that I, I always heard from people that much more knowledgeable about me and more than I was when I was living there is that you're not going to meet a much more patient people than the Burmese. Um, partially because of the Buddhist thing, like the mini life, like they're going to, they're going to, there's another life after this, whatever they're suffering under the military regime. The next life's going to be a little bit better. Um, so, so the fact is she's had one term and there's a lot of people that might be like, yeah, well she hasn't, maybe she's even regressed. Maybe she hasn't done a single thing she promised except for, you know, more crayons in schools or some shit, but give her time. Like it'll, whatever. It, it, you know, the, the arc of justice is whatever, you know. Well, and as you um, said, she won. Um, so they had an election a few weeks ago, which is kind of why we did this. It's time and timely in the sense. And yeah. she won on one hand, she won with like 80 percent of the vote and opinion she won 80 polls, of 75 percent of the seats. Ex right? OK, right, so right. and it's opinion polls leading up to it is that she's like 80, 79 percent approval rating even before the election. So she won like 80% of these seats, as you're saying, or 75% of the seats that were yeah. available to win. Right. But on the other mm -hmm. hand, like in the, in the Rohingya's uh, uh, they have state, and she didn't put out, they weren't allowed to in, vote, basically. Right. right? In Rock Island State, where, the, where they're at, um, is they were not allowed to vote. The, what, they, what they try to say was that in these um, parts of the country that were undergoing a lot of conflicts, it's not safe for us to have election people out there. It's not safe for us to have election monitors. They're going to be targets, you know, just all bullshit on the pretense of disenfranchising people from the vote who were, who have a reason to not vote for her party because her party is not the party of any ethnic minorities. Really. Yes. There are, there are several other small parties there. there well, there's the, um, the USDP, which is like the, the military, the pro military party, basically when, when the, when the military transitioned to the guys in uniforms, to the guys in suits, yes, they were all um, uh, USDP, I think. It's like Solidarity and something party. So they have a party um, on top of the 25 seats they already are, 25% they're already guaranteed. Yeah, they have, they have a party that is also like loyal to the military, but it's not right. like straight up right. the Tomadol, which is the name of their military is the Tomadol. Um, and I think the parliament is called the Pitangsu Yekta, which I'm not 100% sure. That's also a street name in, in Yangon, but um, we'll give it to you. I'll, I'll buy they, it. I believe it. But they didn't want to put in mail-in voting. No, they couldn't want to. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Big they, safety. Yeah, mail, Fraud, right? Yeah, mail. I don't know how how well mail really happens there. I mean, when I was yeah. there, they were still banking using ledgers, no computers. Wow. Um, <laughs> oh wow. <laughs> and this was real. when were your years, by the way? When were you there from? It's, I was there uh, 2013 to 2015. Um, yeah, so I was Shanghai 2010 to 2013, then Burma um, from uh, three monsoon seasons. So I moved there in July and lived there until like the next two Augusts later or whatever. And why doesn't the, the military now just take over again? I believe that – I really believe that it's because they make more money pretending to be open. Mm. Yes. That, because uh, so I moved there, when I moved there in 2013, that was when laws had just kind of changed within the country and um, uh, certain blacklists and embargoes 
from Western countries on Myanmar were lifted. So, you know, in 2012, I could not have legally moved there and worked. True. Unless yeah. I was with like an NGO or an embassy. Because when I first moved there, there was nobody there who didn't work for either the UN or an embassy or an NGO, uh, you know, occasional. They were, like nobody moves there to teach because it doesn't pay. You know what I mean? Whereas you meet a lot of expats that teach other places. Um, yeah, there are a lot later of expats on, in Myanmar in general. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, when I first moved there, we knew, I knew all of them. You know what I mean? Like it was, uh, there were. And you were in the capital city, the main city in the country. I was, well, it's, it used to be the capital and the government built a brand new capital in the middle of nowhere that an astrologer told them to put the capital, um, nice. that it would be very auspicious to put it there. And like, nobody lives there. No foreigner. The only foreigners that live there work for the hotels, like the chefs or whatever. And they fucking hate it. Yeah. Um, and yeah, there's nobody there at all. That's, that's called Nappy doll is the name of that town. But all the, all the embassies and things like that are still in Yangon. Like nobody wants to live in Nappy doll. Nobody lives there. It's, it just doesn't happen. Um, Does the yeah. astrologer live there? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm sure they live in, too. <laughs> live in a nice palace. But they, but they don't have, I mean, tourism in general, though, if you have it, you can't have all these skirmishes on the borders. And, you know, well, you can't you want... go to the borders. You're yeah. not allowed. Like, I couldn't have just traveled anywhere in the country I wanted. Yeah. Kaplan, I went um, there twice. I didn't even know these were going on. I know, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Well, well, yeah. So, but... <laughs> well, I... they conceal it pretty well. They conceal well, it. Yeah. it. It doesn't affect the capital as much. Uh, I mean, when I first moved there, somebody put a grenade in the toilet at the Shangri La Hotel. Whoa. Um, and then there were a couple. Uh, a couple kids got killed when um, like an ethnic group like, put like uh, IE, uh, IEDs underneath like trucks or something. So like the kid would go to like, Oh, there's something under the truck. I don't know what it is. Then boom, they get blown up in the middle of the street. You know, um, there were, that was 2013. There were maybe like two, maybe three explosions, but that's when you're like, okay, there's some stuff going on. They don't want us to know about. Um, <laughs> yeah. I would say. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, when, sorry, go ahead, William. No, some of the stories from, from uh, you know, the borderlands are pretty fascinating. I mean, beyond just the Golden Triangle and everything that goes on there with, you know, opium and uh, methamphetamine production and distribution throughout all of Asia and Australia and, you know, all that area. You know, there was an uh, ethnic group that had child soldiers, the Two Brothers, H-T-O-O. Um, there, there were two, it was like a like a nine-year-old and an 11-year-old that um, were walking around with AK-47s bigger than they were. And they and were the leaders of the, the military. They were the leaders right? because the, the people believed they were impervious to bullets and could summon armies of ghosts. I remember well, that. They're short. It's harder to hit them, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. It's a small target. I mean, my eight-year-old is really good at the Nerf gun games, so I can, well, I can see that. It's before. the same reason you go with, uh, you go with um, what's-his-face in Goldeneye. Um, yeah, you know, <laughs> I know what you mean. I well, it's, it's like in you job. know, in like it's little like league. In, in Goldeneye. Yeah, in little, little league, league the, the coach guy gets all the walks. The coach just tells the shortest guy to sc like crouch, and then yeah, no one can ever pitch in a strike zone. Yeah, low man wins. Uh, God, so kids under she right? How effective has she been otherwise? And just like her other policy. Yeah, the trains running on time. Is it like a, because is she came in uh, with no military? I mean, no government experience, basically, right? She had been this hero figure. But uh, practically no practical government experience, but she did actually she did a tremendous amount of work with the National League for Democracy before like intermittently when she was in and out of house arrest before she was in her house arrest. She would tour the country um, trying to spread democracy with what was uh, the opposition party at the time, the NLD. You Even know, when she, she was in house arrest, she could tour, or when no, she kind like, of in and she out. She was under house arrest the entirety of that yeah. time. Um, but you know, and the government even talked about like, well, she's out spreading democracy again. I think we should kill her. And then somebody was like, well, we can't. I mean, she mm -hmm. actually almost got assassinated at least once. I would um, imagine. Yeah. Yeah. So, so she's not a dilettante to politics for sure. But, okay. um, I, but I, but I think her coalition building is what people kind of were hoping for from her which, you know, it, it's happened in so far as building her own party, but not outreach to anybody who isn't, you know, the majority. Uh, as you said, group. none of the minority groups, She's she hasn't really gone to bat for well, any of them. No, they don't like them. They weren't allowed to vote. They had, some of them have their own parties, their own representatives. And then there were, there were ethnic minority um, 
groups that that did win some seats in the parliament too. So I mean, there is some, you know. But you mentioned it's Buddhist is a, is the pajam the main majority of the country. Buddhist is the majority of the country. Um, a lot of the ethnic groups are like Baptist or Methodist. Oh, um, basically out. what happened is and they're, they're being discriminated against her. Well, yeah. Well, what happened was that the, what had happened was the, uh, white people went in there and tried to convert everybody and all the people in like the, most of the Buddhists in like the main parts of the country where they had food and clothing were like, nah, we're good. We've been sticking with this for you know thousands of years. But like when they would go out into the middle of nowhere where people didn't have like shoes or electricity and they'd be like, Hey, if you read this Bible, we'll feed you. They're like, yeah, sure. That doesn't so, sound like us. <laughs> yeah. Come on. Yeah, so it's like the, it's like the outskirts. It's like yeah, the real the big hicks, the ones that are the, the most red Christian. states. Like of, uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I like forget. here. And what I about the, the Buddhists? Cause this has always fascinated me. Last yeah. time I was there, the Buddhists, I don't know if I took oh, your question, Kaplan, but, but the yeah, Buddhists, I think the same we're in the same place. The, the Buddhists were having like, there was violent Buddhist monks yeah, going Uwaratu. through the streets, which I just never, that blows my mind as a concept. Like yeah, the Richard yeah. Gear, Richard Gear has taught us those people don't exist. Right. Yeah, this, that's Uwarathu why I like this story. Uwarathu. Yeah, U is a um, is like a honorary form of like Mister. Like it's just the letter U. So you'll see somebody's name as U and then their name. Okay. That's just like a really good version of Mister. Whereas Ooh, like Kaplan. Ansan Suchi <laughs> is Da Ansan Suchi D A W. It's an honorific, you know. Got it. Um, He's always described in papers as a firebrand, which is never a, a good thing. Um, <laughs> what is he, Dolly Parton? Well, that's a good thing. But <laughs> he um, he is a, a Buddhist monk, like you said, who leads um, a monastery outside of Mandalay and is available for interviews. Um, he's very into PR. He likes get to get him. out there. He was on the cover of either Time or Newsweek when I was there. It was called like the, the New Face of Buddhist Terror. He was Jeez. regarded as like a Buddhist Hitler. Um, I saw, is he the Buddhist Bin Laden? I saw that. I saw that. Yeah, that would be him too. Yeah. Yeah. He's got um, everything. <laughs> Book him. Yeah. <laughs> Book him. Uh, but yeah, he's a real nasty guy. And he was leading a lot of the anti Muslim stuff and he was leading the violent charges against them. He was also leading general violence against non Buddhists. Like when I was. Um, when I was in Yangon, uh, one of my friends had a bar, advertised a drink night special with a picture of Buddha in headphones that he found online, and he was put in jail for about two years. Uh, Is this 50th that. Street bar? Oh, my God. Uh, he used to run 50th Street. It's not That's the guy you performed. Know. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's, it's uh, yeah, Phil Blackwood, uh, great dude. Shout out to Phil. He used to run 50th Street, then went off on his own thing and was – was basically used as like an example you know he was like using as an example like here's this foreigner he's in you know they the yeah. cops had to stop like a pack of monks from like uh dragging him out of the bar or his home or something i forgot but they so what happened was i don't know if you remember in um like maybe 2012 or 13 when china and japan had another little spot like uh kind of you know tete-a-tete -tete about what was it the Diaoyu islands about the islands between in the east china sea between japan and china they both think yeah they the senkaku or the Aoyu islands so all like the sushi restaurants in shanghai put up signs being like hey we're chinese like calm down leave us alone oh they all <laughs> well, got firebombed or not firebombed yeah, exactly. they got rocks through their windows in suzhou the yeah, japanese kindergarten, like the japanese kindergarten got like rocks thrown at the kids in the playground yeah the same thing happened when i was in yangon where all these bars would put up like the buddhist flag in front of the bar ah, like, hey, we're, we're like please. we're not that guy yeah. Hey, yeah. we're not Phil. You know, no laughing one. Buddha here. No. Uh, <laughs> no. So, um, so by the way, the Buddhists have great PR. I got to say, because like I, I feel like the image in America of Buddha Buddhism is just all peace. Like you don't hear about these incidents. They fix them. There's like a fixer. Or oh, something. yeah. I've I never mean, heard any of these. There isn't a religion I, I, that I, hasn't been used to whip up terror in some way or, or, or shape, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I, I got a lesson learned. Speaking yeah. of, why hasn't the world, anyone in the world stepped up for the, the Muslim, the Ro Rohingyas? You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. Has there been uh there's been a lot of good uh there's been a lot of good journalism about it. I mean, uh, uh I forget the journalist's name, but she won I want to say she won a Pulitzer for her reporting about the um the slave fishermen fishermen like the Rohingya that get put on these boats and 
and how like a Thai general was involved in human trafficking, getting them to, to be, um, you know, slave labor for Thai fishing vessels that would pick them up in, in Burma. And um, how that's why I do not buy any seafood that is labeled Thailand at all, just because it very well could be, you know, slave labor. Oh, yeah, wow. a lot of fish when I was in Thailand. Uh oh. Oh, look, Genoa, Genoa <laughs> tuna, if you see that in the stores, don't buy that shit. That's Thailand. Really? So, what brand? <laughs> oh, well, allegedly, whatever. Don't say doxing tuna, tuna companies whatever. here. I like it. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Take down Big tuna. tuna. So, so the, the, do the people have any, is there any sort of territorial reasons for all this, like, genocide that they're facing, all this discrimination, or just like they don't like them? It, look, just, if there oh, is, yeah, I don't like know, them? because there's nothing, there's not much there. I mean, there is a right. beautiful um, beach resort in Rock Island State, but that was, that's been owned and run by, you know, the generals and their families and the Burmese ethnicity people for years. Because it used to, you could fly into Sitway which is the capital of Rock Island State, and they'd put you on a bus and they'd put the curtains down on the bus so you don't see, like, the Rohingya in, like, oh. in their refugee camps as you drive out to, like, you know, some $500 a night, you know, uh, beach resort. Brutal. Money matters, sir. <laughs> Brutal. What's her – so yeah. what's uh, – on, on, on Sun Tzu Chi, what's her – like, what's, what's her, her plan? Deal? What's her plan going forward? It seems like she's not giving up power, right? She hasn't – Oh. There's no successor I, you know, coming along. I think? haven't heard anything about that. If there is, I mean, I think that I, I, I think that she outwardly facing is trying to say she wants to, to lessen the military's oh, yeah. uh, control over the government. But at the same time, it, you know, I, I worked there as an architect and like half our clients were ex-military you find out like almost any like business or hotel or something is, is some military crony or his family, or there's like five or six families that own half this, like the Jade mines and the opium producing and the Ruby mines. And like, it's, you know, who had the power to jack all that shit years ago and take it for themselves is the military people. So even if they're not still military, they're all still connected. And I, I think that she has to at least, the cynical part of me says all this is, is to make, make it appear to appear like a real democracy to the people of the country and to foreign investors. Um, it's what it seems like. Yeah. Because that's more money into her and the government and the, the right, cronies you build- coffers, you know, if, if she wanted, it almost seems like if she wanted real change, she would need like the EU behind her or some foreign a uh, military that could come in and almost like take over and it's put her in as like a, well, well I, I mean, that's really unprecedented. The only, I mean, the, the look, Cambodia in the mid nineties, uh, the, the UN actually had control of the country and that was like a nightmare. Like there's so many yeah. stories about, about uh, foreigners, like expats coming in there and like, there's a, a book called Off the Rails in Nam Pen, which is fascinating. It talks about those years that it was the, the most psycho foreigners you've ever seen just would move there because they're like, oh, I, like, I can buy, you know, a child and heroin and gun and like, you know, in, in combo. Man. Think, By the way, those people yeah. are still there. I went to Cambodia. Yeah. That's, oh, yeah, trust, yeah. You get a I've free child there. with your heroin. You buy enough. They're yeah. still there. The child thing is, I think, overblown. That's more. Yeah. That's, you know, that's, it's the whatever. sketchiest foreigners. It's the sketchiest expats that I've met in Asia are all in Cambodia. Well, they're not all in, the ones I met, but the ones no, there. That, no, because the people that live in Cambodia, either the people that live in Cambodia that are the sketchiest are not the people that move there because they enjoy Cambodia. It's yes. the people that move there because they got kicked out of Thailand. Exactly. <laughs> and that is like the for real. Um, and but so I have to think that the idea of uh, foreigners coming in and running the country, I mean, nobody wants, no, there's no country that's going to want that, especially a country as fiercely nationalist as the, as the Buddhists have kind of whipped up the Burmese people to be yeah, like, they're never going to accept for like, they're accepting foreigners to come in and, and, you know, distribute money and, and, and visit and be a tourist and come in there and work. But like, they, they don't want them telling them what to do. Um, sure. You know. Makes sense. And you look at like the UN, uh, the UN um, observer that was there, 
you know, she had death threats and like they said awful things about her and almost everybody in Myanmar has at least one Facebook account. Um, they're, it's one of the highest percentages of engagement with a population that Facebook has. Um, and especially for a country that for, for, you know, when I was there to get us to get a SIM card was $1,500 when I first moved there. Really? By the time I left, by the time I left, you get one for free. So, so it's been a rapid shift into the internet. So people don't know necessarily how to pick bullshit from the real stuff. And uh, you know, neither do Americans that have should yeah. know better, but the, the Facebook's role in this is, is significant. And that you is mean part in, of in, the, uh, pr- uh, in public- propagating lies and yeah, like, in, the- you know, a, a, the official Burmese military page, like spreading disinformation about Rohingya and stuff like that. Like it's just, okay. So people some- have like worked up this fervor to believe that Rohingya is somehow the source of all their problems. They're somehow the enemy. If we get rid of them, everything will be yeah, fine. And like they're, they're terrorists and whatever. And like no, Rohingya are like, dirt poor people with almost no country that are struggling for their daily survival. They're trying to, I mean, like I'm sure there there are terrorist attacks sometimes though, or uh, there, there is, there is some activity of like terror cells, but like very minor, but it's, I I mean, I think a lot of what happens is Rohingya that go to like um, Indonesia and Malaysia, where it's shown that they, there are, you know, radical clerics and people that kind of radicalize them and then maybe come back or that, you know, spread that, uh, within the community, but like that's on a percentage basis. I mean, it's probably no higher than any other religion that has their own violent right. fanatics. Yeah, but they don't leave. They go to other places. There's never been a the Rohingya just saying, "I'm getting the hell out of this place." Like they can't. Like they they, yeah. they can't. They don't have like no. citizenship anywhere. They don't have papers right, right, for. Right. They have like a. Yeah. They have a different uh, color like citizenship card than anybody else in Myanmar, and um, Bangladesh has taken them in and kicked them out and taken them in and kicked them out. Like I said, Indonesia and Malaysia take a lot of men um, and um, have a lot of charity for them and do a lot of good things in terms of trying to take them in. But in general, like they don't have really anywhere to go. I mean, they're stuck in a country that doesn't want them, uh, with a border of another country that doesn't want them, and their only way out sometimes is the ocean, and that's, you know. And the lady who won't help them just got reelected with 80% of the vote. So it's not even like there's a... There's no tide ch- turning towards. In well, favor. it's not all rosy for her. I, I should mention. I mentioned earlier she got an Amnesty International gave her an award. Well, they stripped that award from her recently, so she's no oh. longer. Well, bad, guess what other? Courage, Cap- guess what other award she's being stripped from? What's I that? got this T-shirt years ago, thinking that I was going to be the new. <laughs> oh, goodness, look at this, folks. <laughs> for, the, for the audio listeners, he's holding up a National League of Democracy shirt for democracy with a picture of her on it. Yes, it's my it's the only the only other sh- just picture of someone's face on a T-shirt I have is Vlada Divac. That's how much I thought about her. This is like the Che Guevara shirt for yes. you are a college kid reading. It I thought I was Rebel. woker than woke with my fake Che. I was like, they have Che Guevara. I'm one upping it and getting her. Be, shirt. Yeah, it's more unique. It's like no one. Not everyone's going to buy the Stan Smith sneakers. I'm going to buy these other vintage sneakers. I'm going to. Oh, like, yeah. Yeah. But now if the- I, now I'm now I'm scared. If I wear this on the shirt, I'll get I'll get beat up by somebody. Oh no! I mean, there's nobody uh, knows. Okay. Yeah, there's a couple of Burmese joints around New York City. You can go wear that too, and probably welcome. When home. did you get that shirt? Did you get that? I What's don't even best? know if I got. I don't think I got it when I went there with William. I think my brother he definitely went to Burma. Mm. I want to say like 15 years ago, and he must have got it for me then. State he went Department on a, on a college trip, pre State oh. Department, so maybe oh, 20 years pro- ago. <laughs> on a college, yeah, you trip. used to bought- could get. You used to could get um, like a seven day meditation retreat visa. Sounds like Burma, him. and that was the only way you could get in the country as a foreigner for years. So uh, would you, you go? That's how Richard Gere would be there, and you, all the, <laughs> yeah. the Dalai Lama. Oh, well, would. when I was there, Jay Z and Beyonce flew in for like one day to go to uh, to go to Bagan, where all these ancient temples are. And I like went to Bagan. It was beautiful. I mean, it's tough to Did meditate you when Did you, you hear them? people screaming in the background for being murdered. But yeah, <laughs> no, I saw Cardi uh, B was there, not one. then when yeah. I was there. Uh, Bagan. When you see the temples in Bagan, that used to be. There used to be whole little villages all around the foot of those temples, and they cleared that shit out. In the oh, don't place. tell me that. Don't tell <laughs> Everything me Everything you did. Turned- now I got to burn my pictures. You got to burn those <laughs> pictures. The cancer- <laughs> burn that shirt right in the air. Light oh, it up. That's a good idea. This will, this will be like when LeBron left the Cavs. 
Yeah. You just tear it in half. It's a real Sinead O'Connor moment. Burning yes. this jersey. <laughs> So would you uh, imagine, William, this is my last question. If this podcast, say this podcast blew up and 10 million people listened to it, and it was big say, and burning. Why not say it will blow up? Let's be honest. Exactly. We're getting bigger and bigger. Number one in Armenia. Would, would you, no. number one in Armenia. We're not going to be number one in Burma. <laughs> <laughs> would you be, in all honesty, would then you be scared to go back to Burma because of the things you said on this podcast? I would be scared to go back to Burma because a guy who tried to murder me still lives there. But well, Let's talk um, about that. <laughs> how come it took us an hour to get to that story what's that um i i was set up with an apartment by my company it had like four bedrooms and was big but like dusty not great so i was gonna like all right i'll get a roommate or two and you know make some extra cash um there was an italian dude named i'm not gonna say his name it was an italian guy mm. i met at a bar a couple times he was one of the regulars nice guy um, it's not talking the guy to I introduced you to, is it? The guy from Australia? No. Oh, no, nice. not at all. Italian. No. Oh, good. Well, Italian. this is Italian heritage, so I was a little... Oh, okay. Well, no, this guy was straight up Sicilian. He used to be in the oh. Italian Navy oh, and, boy. like, had psycho eyes. Um, <laughs> but he moves in, and um, I remember when when he came to visit to check out the apartment, my friend cut his leg really bad, or had cut his leg really bad, like, on something on the street, and he immediately knew how to get blood out of clothes. Like, eat, like <laughs> that's not good. a Sicilian who knows how to get blood out of clothes. <laughs> yeah. Like, I mean, he was just like, oh, take off your pants, give them to me, rub rock salt on it, put it in cold water. Blood's gone. Um, Bam. And that, well, that works, by the way. So, by but, the way, that's very useful to me because I bleed all the time. So, my <laughs> so yeah. Well, look, long goodness. story short, the guy was like an alcoholic and started using like methamphetamine. So like, well, at first he was a really good roommate, good cook, all that good stuff. Like brought a TV and whatever. Oh. Slowly, he started, like, never sleeping, drinking, like, 50 cans of beer in, like, a weekend without sleeping, and uh, doing – I never saw any meth or pills, but there's no way he wasn't on something, and started to, like, get increasingly, like, delusional, thought I owed him money, um, and then took a took a big, like, fishing knife. He was, like, a fisherman, too, like a serrated fishing knife, and started trying to stab me with it, broke oh, a leg no. off a chair and tried to – stabbed me he stabbed the fishing knife into the wall beside me Whoa. and like his hand slid down it he cut the tip of his pinky off and oh blood was gosh. going everywhere he What'd wiped blood on me <laughs> oh. he flicked blood all over the walls and was like like screaming at me to be a man and <laughs> uh so i grabbed like my phone and my ipad and left the apartment and called the police were you the um, only two? Took, in I like the you took your iPad. It's very important to make sure to get your. Yeah, of course. <laughs> get, get uh, out there. Were you the only two in there? What I realized is I don't know the number for nine one one in Burma. Right. And <laughs> so nine one one everywhere. Just start screaming outside. Like, <laughs> I know I had to call the fixer at my office, and um, at, at like four in the morning, and be like, "Hey, well, my roommate's trying to kill me. Can you call the police?" So a guy, a guy in his pajamas rides a bicycle to my apartment. And I thought he had like, and there is an enraged, jacked Italian former Navy guy running around my apartment like freaking So he's out. a big guy, this guy. He was short, but like, looked like a wrestler. Okay. Um, and the cop pulls up and did not have a weapon. And then I look, and I'm like, oh, okay. He has like a gun on his, on his, on his belt of his little pajamas. No, it was a cell phone in my holster. <laughs> um, so I had to call the fixer again, like, Hey, you need to bring more people. Cause like one little like scrawny cop in his pajamas and flip flops is not going to do anything. <laughs> cops in the pajamas? Flip -flops? What kind yes. Of, what kind of military? Did he have like a this, night right? cap on? Like uh Willie? Oh, Burma's like, the most half-assed fucking country. You gotta like, say there's a Rohingya in you there or something. I don't know. Yeah. Well, they would have <laughs> attacked him then, but like I had to get my landlady because I couldn't kick him out. Cause I didn't have a copy of his passport. What do I, what, I had to pay the cops to kick him out. Yeah. It was a long story, but. I, I never ran into him again, but he apparently is still around there. So and he, he hates you. They didn't deport him. He still. I don't know. I have a feeling that he like would have come out of his stupor and feel like an idiot because he attacked me and got and then like had to. He's actually now like an like, elected senator. I was gonna say, what does somebody like this do for a living in Myanmar? Like, what is he there for? Oh, he ran a uh, sweatshop uh, where <laughs> Burmese people made oh, expensive Italian jackets. Oh like, boy. He tried to get me to buy one one time, and I was because they were not a. It was not a, a ugly jacket. Um, right. uh, it was like a weird, weirdly European looking jacket. You know how like you see like everybody wearing like the Jack Wolfskin stuff. It's yeah, like European version. Yeah, I can't pull it. It's kind of a weird off brand, but 
not Jack Wolfskin, but like his was. And I was like, okay, maybe I'm going to get like a cheap jacket in Burma, made in Burma from the guy who runs the warehouse. He wanted like $400 for it. And I was like, go fuck yourself. No. <laughs> You're like, I know it costs 30 cents to make that. Hey, yeah, literally, literally, literally. It's you literally from a sweatshop. For, there's no, there's no mail. For 40 bucks. I might have yeah. bought it. That's, William Childress. Oh, my wait, God. Can what this guy way, help man. us with our T-shirts? Maybe we can get a better deal in our number one <laughs> our shirts from this guy. guy. Direct sweatshop. Yeah, 40 cents. Uh, but uh, as long as I would go back uh, to do a little stand up. And if I if I had to go to jail, I wouldn't care to it. The name of the prison is it's named after the district of the town that it's in and it's called insane prison oh my gosh that's awesome. i-n-s-e-i-n that's like where all the political prisoners have been for decades that's where uh, phil blackwood went yeah oh, if they're not God. under house arrest that's where they send them yeah there's not a house nice enough to be put under arrest for me there i think Which william childress william childress everybody thank you for doing it man yeah i didn't what mean to cut you off there me. you're in the middle of the no you, you know this is what have you learned about this whole experience i, I mean this what is have like, i learned I've yeah. learned that I, I feel like I'm being told that like Santa's not real or something, you know, that revolutions don't work, that this idea that not- you, this Nelson Mandela lady figure all of a sudden is just, yeah, which she never cared about uh, minorities who were being murdered in the first place. Yeah, yeah she never I- said she did. Yeah, exactly. She was. I've learned that you know, the, everyone not the Buddhists and women leaders. They always say that there's no violence if there's women in charge. Now I'm like, I got one example. I got a That's counterpoint. Right. All I imagine hand is Jacinda well, Ahern on this hand is on some <laughs> She's the, she's the war Jacinda war criminal version. Yeah. All I imagine is like her campaign okay, song. Her campaign song is "It Ain't Me, Babe." <laughs> no, 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 it ain't me. It ain't me you're looking for. All right, that's the episode. William, where can people find you? How can they find you? Uh, yeah, find me on Twitter and Instagram at Hey It's Chili, H E Y I T S C H I L I. And um, I'm going to be rebooting my old podcast, Fat Boy Magic, pretty soon. We're going to have new episodes of that. Me and Anthony Driver, um, my uh, brother from another mother here in Atlanta Comedy. And uh, we're doing shows here, man. I've been doing indoor shows for weeks now. That's like, wild. Atlanta, baby. So, so wild. That's you're, that, you're not you're not fat. You're you're much skinnier now. So uh, how's the pod? You might have to change. Well, the fat name. magic is a men- it's a mentality. Well, he's been in the. Right? Is that why you're in the gym so much? I see you on Instagram. It's, you're always working out. Is it because of that guy almost killed you and Myanmar? You're you're training for him. <laughs> Honestly, that's part of it. Honestly, <laughs> that is part of it. I don't ever yeah, want to you gotta be ready again. <laughs> you right? well, I, want, you I want bigger pecs than that guy. Yeah, you got to do it, man. All right, that's it. Kaplan, uh, William Chill, just thanks for doing it. Kaplan, that's the show. What should we do? Uh, I guess it's time I got to go watch my... I got to get lost. Let's get lost. Get lost.